In our second video for chapter seven, we are going to go ahead and get right into the reactions of alkynes. I'm talking about a little theory at the beginning and then seeing some example reactions at the end of this video for the addition of hydrogen halides and the addition of halogens. So this should look pretty familiar right? because it's not too different from what we saw in chapter six with alkenes. Okay? Alkynes also undergo electrophilic addition reactions. As I mentioned in the first video, we still have the pi bond in here acting as a nucleophile, the partial positive hydrogen here acting as the electrophile. Okay. No different from our alkenes. We've got this cloud of electrons over here that are surrounding both sides of the sigma bond now, right? Top and bottom and inside and outside or front and back, however you wanna think about it. So that's what's making us electron rich, acting as a nucleophile. Okay. Weak pi bonds easily break all of the same reasoning we would have said in chapter six. Okay. So if I take an alkyne and I expose it to a hydrogen halide, the first step is the addition of the electrophile. Okay. Now, previously with an alkene, that would have made an alkyl cation when we were considering those carbocations. Okay. And we're making a different type of carbocation down here when I add a hydrogen halide to an alkyne. Okay. And this is a new term, make sure you're familiar with it. When I have a positive charge on a vinyl carbon, right, it's called a vinylic cation. Okay, so a positive charge on either one of these would be a vinylic cation. Remember the term vinyl carbons from chapter five. Okay. Now a vinylic cation here is less stable than a similarly substituted alkyl cation. Right? So the same degree of substitution, but I've got a positive charge on an SP hybridized carbon. Right? An SP is more electronegative than sp2 or sp3 like i would have had up here okay. so that means that this is more electronegative and yet has a positive charge and therefore these are less stable these vanillic cations look at them in this degree of stability going from most stable up here down all the way through to the vinyl cation not stable at all okay. so what we show i'm jumping back here to slide 23 it's not actually this clear cut. When I take alkynes and expose them to an electrophile, uh, they go through what's called a pi complex. And right? because I don't want to form that vinylic cation, it's too unstable. So I form something not too unlike the cyclic bromonium or the cyclic chloronium that was introduced in chapter six. Right? A partially broken pi bond here partially formed sigma bond to hydrogen, partially broken hydrogen chlorine bond right there. And so know this from slide 25, know what the pi complex looks like. What evidence do we have that that actually forms? Well, if I take an alkyne here, it preferentially forms the Z isomer. And that's the evidence that we have for the pi complex because again, I'm jumping back to slide 25. If I have this pi complex, it's blocking the approach of a nucleophile from both sides. Right? If this didn't exist, then it would be a 50-50 shot of E and Z. But if one side is blocking the approach of the nucleophile, that means it has to come from one side only. And I'm gonna preferentially get the Z isomer via an anti-addition. And so the stereochemistry is giving me evidence for the formation of that pi complex. Less little bit of theory. Uh, alkynes are less stable than alkenes are. Notice they have higher gives free energy over here, but they're also less reactive okay, because of the energy of that transition state. Normally, if something is less stable to begin with, it's more reactive. That's because it wants to undergo a reaction. But because the energy for this pi complex, the energy difference here, is greater than the energy difference down here, right? Alkynes are less stable and less reactive than alkenes were. That's larger delta G transition state for those. So now we get into the reactions. Addition of hydrogen halides first and then halogens. Both of these reactions are regioselective. So we've got to think about, do we have a terminal alkyne or an internal alkyne? And because I have two pi bonds, if you have excess of the other reagent, then you can do two additions, right? Two pi bonds 
two additions, and we maintain that regio selectivity that I just mentioned. Okay, my electrophile is adding to the less substituted sp2 carbon, hydrogen in the first case being the electrophile. So I undergo one addition, okay, and I get my H and my Cl that added. I go from an alkyne to an alkene because I broke one pi bond. If I have excess HCl, then it can happen again. And some new terms here, right? a halo substituted alkene. So it's an alkene with a halogen coming right off of one of those vinyl carbons. And then the final product, you have, you have excess HCl, is a geminal dihalide. Right? That means that's a molecule with two halogens coming off of the same carbon. So two CLs here, that's a geminal dihalide, geminal dichloride to be more specific. Could have a geminal dibromide as well, which is different from a vicinal dihalide from chapter six, right? In a vicinal dihalide, they were on two neighboring carbons, right? Like if I had one here and then another one over here and that was just a sigma bond, that's a vicinal dihalide. This, both coming off of the same carbons, geminal dihalide. But again, the equivalents are important equivalencies okay? because this isn't super reactive, which means you can stop the reaction, okay? Chlorine being electronegative withdraws electrons via inductive electron withdrawal from chapter two, which means it reduces the electron density in the pi bond here, makes it a poorer nucleophile. Yeah, so it's less reactive than a normal alkyne or a normal alkene. It's the least reactive of all of them. But if you have excess HCl, it will react again. So I can stop it here, or I can continue going. Notice that if it's an internal alkyne, they have the same degree of substitution. Right? I'm going to jump ahead a little, a couple of slides here. Okay, too many slides. So take my word for it. If it's an internal alkyne. Right, it's an alkyne in the middle, two alkyl substituents coming off of both of them. It can't be regioselective because they have the same degree of substitution. But if it's a terminal alkyne, and only if it's a terminal alkyne, then it's regioselective. Okay. This carbon has more hydrogens, so it gets the electrophile, which is hydrogen in this case. So it gets the H, and the Cl goes there. Right. What's the mechanism? Well, my first arrow starts at my pi bond. Right, attacks the hydrogen electrophile, breaks this bond, which goes to chlorine. That is the exact same as what we had in chapter six. The only difference here in chapter seven is the intermediate here, because as we just mentioned, it goes through the pi complex. Right. The alkyne nucleophile reacts with an electrophile to form a pi complex, and then the nucleophile comes in, attacks the pi complex, right, breaks these bonds, breaks that bond, that forms a halo substituted alkene. The only thing you have to be careful for, right? Because I had a terminal alkyne to start, my chlorine has to attack this carbon specifically, the one with the alkyl group. And then after that, you have an alkene. So if you have a second equivalent, you'd already know how to draw that mechanism, which we'll have in just a second. But considering the transition states, right? We want the partial positive to be here on the more substituted carbon which is exactly what we see right here. More stable transition state by putting the chlorine on the more substituted carbon. And, and then after that, we continue to be regioselective. Alkene plus HCl, you already know what that mechanism looks like. This is exactly what we would expect from chapter six. And that is how I form my geminal dichloride. Okay. Again, because it goes through the more stable carbocation, that gives me the more regio or the regio selectivity of the reaction, right? If it was happening over here, it's forming a primary carbocation, and then chlorine is going to further decrease that stability by inductive electron withdrawal. Right? Over here, I form a secondary carbocation, which you already know is more stable, right? but it's even more stable than you would anticipate because chlorine can actually donate a little bit of electron density there, right? Share some electrons into that bond and stabilize the positive charge. 
Now, the mechanistically, these should be pretty simple as long as you are comfortable with chapter six. The challenge in chapter seven comes with looking at your alkyne. Is it terminal? Is it internal? Is it symmetrical? Is it asymmetrical? And thinking about all the possible products. So if I have an alkyne and I have excess HBr, it's going to add twice the HBr. And because it's internal, it's not going to be regioselective. So that means I can add an H and a Br here to start, which that does control the second reaction, right? You'll always form a geminal dibromide, but both bromines can go here or both bromines could go here. So you get two different products in these geminal dihalides, one where they're on carbon two, which is this carbon, and another one where they're on carbon three, this one here. Okay. So if you're jotting down notes, what you wanna record for yourself, addition of excess hydrogen halide to an unsymmetrical or an asymmetrical internal alkyne Okay, so asymmetrical internal alkyne gives you two geminal dihalides, one where it adds to one carbon and one where they add to another carbon. If it's symmetrical, this is what you got to be on the lookout for. If it's symmetrical, you only get one product, one geminal dihalide. And this will make sense if you think about it in 3D. Right? One product where they add here, one product where they add here, but because it was symmetrical to begin with, both of those are the same in 3D, right? The product that's shown over here looks like both of them were added here. However, it doesn't matter if you were numbering this left to right or right to left, it's three, carbon three, both times, right? So even if the both bromines added here, if you take that and flip it 180 degrees, it's the same product that's shown over here. Okay, so if it's a symmetrical internal alkyne, you only form one geminal dihalide because it's the same thing in 3D. Okay. We finish by the addition of chlorine and bromine. Only one slide on these okay, because the behavior is exactly the same thing as what we had with our alkenes. Okay. You have chlorine in dichloromethane or bromine in dichloromethane. Right? The dichloromethane is just a solvent. Okay. You add one equivalent, they add across from one another, you add a second equivalent, and then you've got four chlorines or four bromines. Mechanisms the same as alkenes. The reactions you would predict are exactly the same as alkenes. So it's not really worth spending any time, right? Just know as long as you have excess halogen, Cl2 or Br2 only, you end up with four of them in your final product on adjacent carbon. So know those reactions from this video, know the pi complex, and make sure you're still comfortable with the mechanisms. A lot of this is continuing from chapter six. We're now just relating them to alkyne.